Good morning, everyone. My name is Elena. Internationally, we associate the waving of the white flag with surrender. The white flag symbolizes a truce or ceasefire and is often displayed by the weaker party who want to surrender. In the Middle Ages, loyalty revolved around oaths and displaying one's banner. To swear allegiance to a lord or to change allegiances, armies would wave the flag of the opposite side to surrender. Philip II, King of France, used a single white flag as the Capet family emblem and to represent the French crown. A few years later, the significance of the white flag was embellished in a battle between the French and English monarchies. According to one historian, the story goes as follows. In 1194, the English, under the rule of Richard the Lionheart, were defending Fretable Castle in France while the French put up a siege around the castle. On the 4th of July, the English, knowing they couldn't withstand the siege, came clad in white tunics, barefoot, holding up white cloths to King Philip and his invading army, indicating their surrender. The colour white was synonymous with the royal Capetian flag and was the medieval way of showing submission and dominance. The history of the white flag has been connected to feudalism and the pledge of loyalty to lords and nobles. But by the Middle Ages, the significance of a white banner expanded from just French royalty to a worldwide indication of surrender. While the meaning and the use of the white flag has developed over the years, its international recognition can be dated to 12th century medieval France. As a general sign of surrender, prisoners or hostages would attach a piece of white paper to their helmets and troops who had surrendered would carry white batons. We can see that the meaning and recognition of the white flag has developed over time for surrender, but this form of surrender is admitting defeat and a sense of giving up. The Bible also talks about surrendering our lives to God, not in defeat, but more in submission and acknowledging that we can't do it on our own, we need him to work through us. So what exactly does the Bible have to say about surrender? If we turn to Luke 9, verse 23 to 25, we read, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? Jesus is talking to both his disciples and the crowd, calling anyone who wants to follow him to take up their cross. But what does it mean to take up our cross and why daily? This is a bit of a foreign expression for us these days. If I were to say this to my workmates at Boost Juice, it would make no sense to them. In Bible times, the person who was being crucified would carry his own cross. So when Jesus said, take up our cross, he's saying to die, not literally, but to self. Unlike the symbol of the white flag, this is not giving up in defeat, but rather in submission, allowing Jesus into our lives so he can work through us. Jesus also told us to take up our cross daily. Why? Because as humans, we tend to forget things, turn to our own ways, and think we can do it on our own. Instead, Jesus wants to be part of our lives, and to allow him to do that effectively, we must invite him to work through us each day. This means spending time with him through his word, the Bible, and prayer. Jesus' invitation to the crowd in Luke 9 is an invitation for us too. If we want to be a follower of Jesus, we must lay aside our worldly plans and aspirations and take up our cross daily. C.S. Lewis, a famous Christian writer, explained it this way. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. 
Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will ever be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him everything else thrown in. When we turn our lives into Jesus' control, we accept the fact that we are sinful human beings and a life with God has so much more to offer. In Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, Paul writes, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Here we read that as followers of Christ, we are to give our bodies to God, be set apart from the world, and allow God to transform us. To not copy the behavior and customs of this world means turning from things that may be initially attractive but detrimental overall. Things such as striving for popularity, caring too much about our appearance, or overworking ourselves just to greater, get a greater income. Instead, God calls us to choose a life following him and letting him transform us. When we let Jesus into our lives to transform us, we become a new and better person, someone that we couldn't be on our own accord. God will change the way we think. By surrendering our lives to him and having him work through us, we begin to know what his plan is for us and how we can live our lives honoring him. It is not easy to surrender our lives to God, but we know that it is a submission rather than defeat, which makes it so much more worthwhile. C.S. Lewis also writes, the terrible thing, the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes and precautions to Christ. But it is far easier than what we are all trying to do instead. We are all trying to let our mind and heart go their own way, centered on money or pleasure or ambition, and hoping, in spite of this, to behave honestly and chastely and humbly. And this is exactly what Christ warned us you could not do. He too acknowledges that surrender is hard, but notice that he also mentions it is far easier to submit our lives to God rather than to do it on our own. Paul writes again in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 about letting Christ work through us. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weaknesses. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. Upon reading this, you may wonder, why does God work through us when we are at our weakest and lowest point in life? It is when we are at our weakest that we begin to acknowledge God's working in our life and understand that we can't do it on our own. When we come to that realization, we are willing to let God into our lives to transform us and make us into the person he wants us to be. It is important to note that it is not something to be ashamed of. In fact, Paul says, So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses, because he knows that only when he accepts that he can't do it on his own, then the power of Christ can work through him. Once we fully surrender to God, that is when he can come into our lives and work through us. It is a submission to God, allowing his will to take control of our lives because his plan for us is far better than we can imagine. So how does this surrender or submission or white flag look like practically? Jamie will share some more. Can you hear me? Good? Oh, there it is. All right. Wow, that was beautiful. 
I honestly don't know how I can uh, go on after that, to be honest. That was actually amazing. Um, thank you again, worship team, for that. Um, and also want to thank Elena as well for your first part as well. Um, so my name is Jamie Milson. Um, maybe some of you have seen me around here uh, for a bit. I've been here for a couple years. But uh, yeah, this, I'm going to be preaching today on the second part of part two, Surrender. Um, going, I guess, next to what Elena said. Um, but before I go into uh, anything first, I just want to pray and just kind of invite the Spirit here to be with us and be with me as well. So if you can please all bow your heads, that'd be great. Um, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that we can all be here on this Sabbath day and be here as a community, as a church family, and uh, come for the sole reason of worshiping you and having a day of rest as you've given us, Lord. I pray you can have the Holy Spirit here in this room. Um, please have the Holy Spirit be with me as I uh, try and portray a message that you'd like um, the rest of all, of all of us to hear, including myself. And I pray, please, just for everyone to take something from it and take something from the whole surrender s- service that we've um, put together, Lord. And thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, so I'm going to be doing part two of this surrender s- service. Um, Elena did a great job talking about the worldly version or worldly definition of surrender um, and how that compares to what the Bible says about surrender and I guess the difference of the two. My role in this sermon is going to be talking about how um, any biblical examples we have of surrender and um, any characters or I guess people in the Bible that experience and I guess have this trait of surrender to God. So first off, um, the one I come to mind the most or a lot is Moses. Um, Moses obviously grew up in Egypt and everything and then had an uh, interaction with God at the burning bush and God asked him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And Moses, despite his initial reluctance and maybe feelings of inadequacy for certain traits he possessed, he eventually did lead the Israelites out of Egypt And also, I guess, he ended up leading him to the promised land. So that's one. Another one is Mary, mother of Jesus. Um, Obviously, she uh, raised the savior of the world, and that's a very big responsibility on her shoulders. Um, But in Luke 138, um, she took it by the chin in complete surrender to God. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. That's Luke 138. And her surrender allowed God's plan of salvation to unfold through her and then through Jesus. However, the main person I want to talk about today is none other than Abraham. So, as you can see, FYI, that's Abraham from the VeggieTales uh, version of it. And I guess, uh, actually last night, I actually watched the VeggieTales version of Abraham just for a pre-sermon prep and everything. You can, you'd be surprised how much you can learn from talking vegetables, so it was great. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about Abraham today, and I'm going to be focusing on, I guess, his surrender to, to God, and obviously his, his role overall in, I guess, the Israelite nation, and what we have today is, because as God promised him generations and generations, um, because of his surrender. And I'm going to focus on three surrenders um, today. So I'm going to focus on three main surrenders, I think, play crucial parts, I guess, in his surrender to God. Um, The first one is Abraham leaving home. So the first verse I have is Genesis 12, 1 through 4. By the way, all this first point is all in Genesis 12, if you want to follow along. But it's Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Um, It says, the Lord told Abram, leave your country, your relatives, your family home, and travel to the land I'm going to show you. I'll make you the ancestor of a great nation, and I'll bless you. I'll make sure you have a great reputation and that you are a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Everyone on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left the fo- following the Lord's instructions and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 when he left Haran. Um, one thing that stuck out to me in this uh, verse is that as soon as God talks to him, Abram, it literally says, so Abram left following the Lord's instructions straight away. So there was not any hesitance or anything, um, and it just seemed like it was immediate and obedient to God. Um, and like I mentioned before, there was others that were very, like, they're very great Bible heroes and everything, and they, they surrendered to God, but there was a bit of hesitancy at first. The so one I said before was Moses. 
because maybe because of his own personal feelings of inadequacy and other reasons. Another one that comes to mind is also Gideon as well. Uh, Gideon obviously did great things and surrendered to God, but he asked for multiple signs before um, him, I guess, partaking in the thing that God wanted him to do. So, but Abraham was straight away, um, like instant, uh, immediate to God's calling. Um, and I guess another thing is too, is that we think of it, he was leaving his land of Ur, his home country, and we just think, oh, he's just moving away with his wife and I guess some possessions. But no, like back then, I guess land was also inheritance. And I guess inheritance means that that was the family's land. He was leaving his inheritance behind that his father and his great father, grandfather and all that were leave, left him behind. So he left everything pretty much. And it's also mentioned in the next slide as well. Which said, yep, it says Hebrews 11.8, where it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So it just shows that complete surrender of everything that uh, Abraham did. Um, and then the next point I have is going to be Genesis 12.7. And it's talking about, in the same chapter, um, God actually promised, has his first promise he gives Abraham there. Um, and it says, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I'm going to give you this land to your descendants. So Abraham built an altar to the Lord there because that was where the Lord appeared to him. That was in Canaan as well. So that's the second time actually God has um, come to Abraham and pro given him a promise. And then after that to, I guess, I guess, remember the promise, Abraham built an altar showing worship to God and showing surrender to God. Um, in, this, in this time as well, at the end of the chapter, they talk about uh, Abraham and also going to Egypt and everything with Sarah and Lot and everything. And in this moment, there's moments in Egypt where you can see he doesn't quite fully, he hasn't fully surrendered everything. There's some things that he still needs to work on, like he didn't fully surrender um, when he was afraid in Egypt. That they're going to they're gonna kill him because uh, he was married to Sarah. So he said, oh, uh, she, tell them you're my sister and everything. And that led to a bunch of problems. So that wasn't great. And he should have just trusted God there. But overall, he's been very, in the early parts of the relationship with God, he's been very faithful and surrendered to him. Um, next point is going to be, there it is, Abraham's right to choose. So this is Genesis 13. And uh, the first passage I have is Genesis 13, 2, and then also 5 to 7. Uh, it says, Abram was very rich, having many herds of livestock and a great deal of silver and gold. Lot, who was traveling with Abram, also had many flocks, herds, and tents, so much so that the available land couldn't support both of them. They had so much livestock they couldn't stay together anymore. Abram's and Lot's herdsmen were also arguing, and in addition, the Canaanites and Parasites were also living in the land at that time. So we can see there's a bit of conflict going on between, um, not Abram and Lot per se, but more their, their, um, their shepherds and I guess the people that, that work for them. And then also it was just too little land for too many people and I guess probably too much livestock. Um, so that's a bit of an issue there. Um, we can safely assume as well though that Lot, one of the reasons why Lot was probably very wealthy and affluent as well was probably because even though he was probably faithful to God too, but Abraham was really faithful to God and he probably benefited off some of Abraham's I guess, faithfulness and surrender to God as he was in the land at that time. But at that point, um, I guess the next point, Abram talks to Lot. And he says, so Abram, so Abram said to Lot, please don't let have arguments between us or between our herdsmen because we're family. If you, you see all this land that's available right in front of you, we have to split up. If you choose to go to the left, I'll go to the right. And if you choose to go to the right, I'll go to the left. So immediately you're seeing Abraham He's like surrendered his right to choose where he goes, even though he probably had majority of the wealth and, and majority of the land. But he, he knows, you can see he knows that God will be with him no matter where he goes. And he surrendered to God fully. And it's like, you know what? Wherever Lot chooses, so be it. I know you, you want me to go the other direction. So you can see that surrender there because that would have been a big thing as, as um, um, one of the sides was near Sodom was way more, um, was better land and had more, I guess, natural resources. And I guess Lot chose the more fruitful land near Sodom. So he did, he chose the best, the best picking of the land. Um, yeah, I guess ultimately Abram surrendered his choice to where to live, to cater to his nephew, which was, I guess, I guess also surrendering his choice to Lot also meant he trusted God. And uh, I guess the next 
part we have near the end of the chapter as well is we have uh, God talking to, um, to Abraham after separating from Lot. He told Abram, look around you from where you're standing to the north, south, east, and west. You will have so many descendants that they'll be like the dust of the earth. If anyone could count dust, then they would have to count the number of your descendants. Go and walk through the whole land in all directions because I'm giving it to you. So not only is he eventually his people going to have where Lot is, he has everywhere. He's saying you go north, south, east, and west, and he will have descendants numbering more than the sand, which is pretty crazy, knowing how much sand there is. Um, but it's amazing, this, this I guess, um, reoccurring promise that you see from God um, happening again. And God's saying the whole way, I'm going to be with you. I'm promising you all this if you surrender to me and stay faithful and follow my path. Um, and then this leads me on to, I guess, my personal experience surrendering to God. Um, I guess reading through this passage and everything, it kind of reminded me of some parts, sometimes in my own life, where uh, maybe I was trying to go out it my own way, or I was, you know, stressed about things and everything, but having to surrender to God, um, I guess, because surrender to God, what I was going through, and just give it all to God. Um, I guess an, an example would be, I guess, moving to Australia at 18. I lived in America for most of my life and everything, and uh, I guess the move over here after living 15 years over there, going through all school and high school and everything, um, as well as just having friends there and being like developed there, um, it's hard to be like kind of ripped from a part. You um, being ripped away from a part like a place you've been, and so um, yeah, I guess for that moment, I remember it was in hotel quarantine. I um, guess when the COVID was going around, and I remember just praying to God, being like, look, um, I'm here, I'm here now, and if this is where you want me to go, you've, you've led me this far, and um, it, wherever you want me to go, I know you'll be with me, I know you'll put the right people in my life, and I know you'll put the right church, and I guess, and I guess opportunities in general in my life, and he has, so that's been great. Um, and there's even still things that I need to surrender to, I think, as we all probably have that. Um, I guess another thing is to just long-term where I'm going to be at and everything. It can get daunting to think about. So I guess every day, a daily thing of surrender to God is crucial, I think, in order to just, I mean, to be, I guess, mentally well as well, but know that God's there. Because he'll do a better job than, I guess, we'll do ourselves. So. And so I encourage, again, I encourage all of you guys as well, if you have any um, struggles or burdens or things you're going through, um, just give it to God cause, and surrender it to God because he'll do more, much more than you can do yourself in your own way. And um, he has your best interest at heart and he knows you better than yourself. So that's, that's kind of comforting to know that for sure. Um, some verses that back this as well, what I, what I think about personally surrendering to God, um, I think Elena mentioned the same, I guess, same quote, just different in Luke, but um, it says, then Jesus told his disciples, if you want to be a follower of mine, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Um, so that's great words from Jesus there. Um, Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And then Psalms 37, 23 to 24, um, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though, he's full, though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. Which is another very comforting verse as well. All those are, I guess, biblical um, examples of what we should do practically in our lives and surrendering to God. And I guess this leads me, I said I had three surrenders from Abraham in the beginning of my talk, and this leads me on to my third one, I thought, to save it for loss. And maybe some of you may know where this is going, um, but the one I'm thinking of is the ultimate surrender Abraham had to face. And uh, this is the ultimate surrender. Let's just put some context before this surrender. Um, Abraham was 100 years old when he had a son that he always wanted for such a long time, and he, they never could have children. And imagine, I think, uh, Abraham wanted a son for a long time, and he had to wait so many years for it. And things and bumps in the road happened along the way. Um, he ended up having a son with Sarah's um, servant, Hagar, and then that wasn't God's intended plan. Um, and God would say the whole time, I'd give you a son. Um, 
But eventually, God actually did give, uh, Sarah did have a, have a kid, was pregnant, and gave Abraham and Sarah a son. And God calls out to Abraham once he's older a bit. He says, God told him, go with your son, with your only son, the one that you love, to the land of Moriah, and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll tell you about. And the text says immediately that Abraham got up early in the morning and cut firewood for the offering, listening to what God had said. Can you imagine that? I mean, I'm not a father yet. I want to be a father one day, but I couldn't imagine having to do anything like that, anything of the sorts. It's just, it seems very, very, a very crazy and tough thing to do. And it's like, he was probably very torn in the moment. He was like, oh, like God's, like, what's God saying? Like, God is after all this time has given me my one and only son that I've wanted for so long. And then as soon as I get some good years with him and at like around mid-age, he, I have to go sacrifice him and he can't, he can't have a descendant and he can't have a son that he loves anymore. So he probably would have been thinking all this. But again, it says he got up early and cut firewood for the offering, listening to what God had said, showing that full surrender. And um, so they climbed up the mountain and everything. They gathered the firewood, climbed up the mountain and then they made the altar up there. And it was just Isaac and Abraham. Uh, they made the, made the uh, altar up there. And Abraham put Isaac on the, on the altar. And eventually an angel says to him, Don't touch the boy. Don't do anything to him. Because now I know that you truly do what God tells you. You didn't refuse to give me your son, your only son. Which is amazing. Just right at the last second, an angel comes. And imagine the relief that Abraham must have felt in that moment. Um, and then they end up finding a normal ram in the bushes, and then they use that for the sacrifice. But again, we see this for the, the fourth time right here, and it says, um, The angel of the Lord shouted again to Abraham from heaven, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that because you have done this and didn't refuse to give me your son, your only son, you can be sure that I will bless you and give you many descendants. They will be as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sand of the seashore, and they will conquer their enemies. So you see again that promise again after all Abraham has done and that whole that massive surrender, willing to give up his own son because God told him to, is amazing. Amazing surrender to God. It shows that Abraham's surrendering in faith was more than just mortal or it, like on this earth. It was something different. There was more to it. Um, so there was, a, there was a couple of verses that I skipped in between, but I want to go back to this verse. Um, and it's when Isaac and Abraham are climbing up the mountain. And the verse says, it says, Isaac said to Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, well, we have the fire and wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering, Isaac asked. And it says, God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham replied. And they went up on walking together again. Uh, it's Genesis 22, 7 to 8. And again, God was true. God did provide the lamb for Ab Abraham and Isaac, even though at that time they thought it was Isaac, but God did provide a lamb for Abraham and Isaac in the bushes. But ultimately, God provided a lamb for us so that we could be saved. So, and I just want to leave you on that thought of, you know, ultimately God provided a lamb for us so that we could be saved. And there's one more quote. I like to share, I guess, along that line, tying the salvation story and the sacrifice that Abraham made. It's from Ellen G. White, from The Signs of Times, The Faith of Abraham. And it says, One can only imagine the father's thoughts. Every step that Abraham advanced towards Mount Moriah, the Lord went with him. All the agony and grief that Abraham endured during the three days of this dark and fearful trial were imposed upon him to give us a lesson in perfect faith and obedience and that we might better comprehend how real was the great self-denial and infinite sacrifice of the Father in giving his only Son to die a shameful death for the guilty race. No trial, no suffering or tests could be brought to bear upon Abraham, which would cause such mental anguish, such torture of soul, as that of obeying God and offering up his Son. Um, I encourage you all to think about surrendering your lives to God and let him guide your steps. And when you do, Think about the great people of the Bible, like Abraham, who surrendered to God continuously, even when it was hard to let go. 
And most importantly, think about the ultimate surrender of God, giving up his son and Jesus, his son, surrendering to the plan to save us from sin. God bless. And surrender of submission. And Jamie was telling us some Bible characters that have gone through submission of their own. And I would like to add to this that when we surrender, that is when we achieve victory. When I was looking at uh, Bible characters who have surrender in their story, I realized that there was a moment they generally had where they realized they needed to surrender. This aha moment, if you will. We see this right in the beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden when they realize they're naked and they need a savior to save them. We see this with Moses at the burning bush. We see this with Abraham and all the parts that Jamie pointed out for us. And one of my favorite moments of surrender came from a man in a temple. Now this man was influential. He was a judge among his people. He was competitive, but he had some problems. He had some anger issues. He threw some temper tantrums. And yet, despite all of this, God was still able to use him powerfully. Now, this person that I'm talking about is none other than Samson. We pick up Samson in his valley of despair. He's between the temple. He's tied up, resting his hands on the pillar. He's blind. He is weakened because he decided he could get through it on his own. He relied on his own strength, and it brought him to this place. And yet, in this valley of despair, he reaches out to God, and he calls to him in a moment of surrender. Please open your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 16. And we're going to read of Samson's plea, Samson's call to surrender. So in Judges chapter 16, and we're going to read verse 28 to 30. So in Judges 16, 28 to 30, it reads, Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple. He braced himself on them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead he killed at his death were more than those that he killed in his life. You see, when we come to God and surrender, even if it is in a moment of despair, God can still use us. And like Samson, I've found myself in a valley of despair before because I decided I could rely on my own strength. I could get through on my own without surrendering to God. Hi. My name is Ellie, for those of you who don't know me. I've been attending Mount Gravatt Church for over a year now, and I'm a teacher at North Pine Christian College. Um, One thing that I want you to know about me is that I'm a very competitive person. Um, I was raised in a household that encouraged healthy competition. My dad was captain of his cricket teams and his rugby teams. My mum was a champion squash player. She got recruited for the boys' indoor cricket team at college. So it's safe to say that competition is in my DNA. However, my love or my competitive streak is more driven for my hate for losing rather than my love for winning. And so it's no wonder that this concept of surrender I used to struggle with when I was younger because I thought to surrender meant to lose. I thought to surrender meant defeat. And so this skewed version of surrender sent me down in a spiral. When I was 11, my nan was diagnosed with cancer for the first time. And unfortunately, cancer became a common name that was thrown around in my household. You see, my nan had been diagnosed with cancer five times, and each time the doctors got it, the margins were good, the chemotherapy worked, my nan went to live another year, and all was good, until one day the doctors didn't catch it on time. Instead, they missed her cancer, and it spread. It metastasized throughout her body, her cancer became inoperable, and my nan was taken from me years before she should have been. This grief that I felt in the following years after losing my nan um, turned toxic. And instead of surrendering this grief to God and thinking, yes, God will carry this with me, I thought I could get through it on my own. Now we pair that grief with a toxic relationship. We pair it with 
stress of year 11 exams and that grief turns into blame. That grief turns into anger and I directed it at God. Now, instead of going to God and fighting with him, I started to fight against him. And this led to a valley of despair. This led to darkness. This led to depression. And after a year of battling with this, on the anniversary of my nan's passing, I had my first attempt to take my life. Fast forward two years after my nan's passing, another two attempts, and I was a shell of a human being. The joy of life was gone. I didn't care about life anymore, but I had a plan. But God had a bigger one. See, my plan then, when I was 15 or 16 years old, I thought the most important thing in my life is my year 12 exams. So I had to finish my year 12 exams, otherwise there was no point to everything else I had done in my life previous to this. So I decided that November 16, 2016 would be the last day that Ellie Pemmon would exist on this earth. However, God decided differently. You see, the day before I was supposed to um, get the pills to help me with that plan, I ended up in hospital with an infection of my brain. And I was brought to death's door once more, but this time I wasn't in control. And when I was in hospital for days on end with pain, all I could do was lay in darkness, sit in the hot shower, and cry myself to sleep, quite honestly. The only thing I could do was deal with this question, what is God's plan for me? Do I want to live or do I want to give up? And it was in that moment at night, sometime between the nurses checking in on me, between the beeping of my machines, that I decided maybe all those voices were lying to me. Maybe there was a bigger plan after all. And in that moment, I sent out a plea, a request of surrender. And I said, Lord, please save me. But my surrender was a white flag surrender. It wasn't a surrender of complete submission. Now, in the months following this, I went through the repercussions of battling with um, my brain injury. I would have headaches every day. I was in constant pain. I had continuous nausea. My photographic memory was gone. My hearing decreased. My eyesight, I all of a sudden needed glasses. And I would begin to grapple with short-term memory loss to the point of forgetting who I was on occasion. And in this forgetfulness, friends, I forgot my surrender. I forgot my call to God to save me. After this, I was dealing with anxiety to a point that if I left my room, I would have a panic attack. I couldn't exist in the world safely, at least in my brain, and so I ended up shutting off everything in order to cope. I thought, there's no other way to do this, and so I completely shut down. And in that shutting down, I became a person that I was scared of. I didn't laugh, I didn't cry, I didn't smile, I didn't feel anything. Repercussions and guilt didn't apply to me. And I became scared of who I was becoming. Until one day, the power of prayer broke through. And praise God that people pray for us. And I was able to surrender. And I surrendered to God in a surrender of submission. You see, I realized that surrender wasn't a sign of weakness, but rather a sign where you were strong enough to realize that God needs to fight for you. In that moment of surrender, when I used to think I would lose, where I would admit defeat, instead I ended up gaining victory. And we're going to turn to the Bible to read about Jesus and the example he set for us for surrender. So please turn with me to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. So we're in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew 26, and we're going to be reading from verse 36 to 39. Matthew 36, sorry, Matthew 26, verse 39, 36 to 39. My goodness, it's a good thing it's on the screen. All right, so verse 36 says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to become sorrowful and deeply distressed. See, friends, we see here that the weight of sin, the sin that we've all committed, is being placed on Jesus' shoulder right now, and he's going through despair. He's being weighed down by it. And in verse 38, he tells us, 
that he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Now, when we look at the other Gospels, it gives us more insight. When we look at Luke 22, verse 44, it says, In this moment, Jesus starts to sweat blood. Now, being a biology teacher, I was very fascinated by this, and I wanted to know what the biological phenomena that Jesus was experiencing was. And I learned that it's something called hematidrosis, and this is where the extreme emotional or physical stress that someone is under causes your blood vessels to rupture. The blood then is going to go out of your pores and you will sweat blood. Now, this is a condition that is very rarely documented because people who experience this often die soon after. Now, Jesus right now is going through this pain because it is the first time in his life where he is experiencing separation from God. We've experienced this every day, but Jesus has never been apart from his father And unfortunately, some of us here know what it is to be separated from a loved one. Some of us know what grief feels like. Some of us have felt that pain, not being able to reach someone that you love. And unlike me, in my testimony, where that loss, that grief nearly brought me to death's door, instead Jesus does the right thing here. And friends, he turns to God and he surrenders. And we read this in verse 39. He, being Jesus, went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And we're going to really take this step-by-step reading through this verse, because I find that growing up in the church or hearing sermons often, that we kind of get um, distracted by the magnitude of what's happening here. So I'm going to read this verse again, and I want you to focus here. I want you to picture this in your minds. So he, being, he, Jesus, went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. We're going to pause right there, and what I want you to do is close your eyes or focus, do whatever you need to do to picture this. Because here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we have Jesus. Jesus, the one who was there at the beginning of the world. Jesus, who was in the lion's den and closed the mouth so Daniel didn't get eaten. Jesus, who was there with Abraham. Jesus, the one who was on the battlefield with Deborah. Jesus, the one who parted the Red Sea. He is in the garden fighting for you and for me. You see, Jesus is laying in the dirt right now. He is sweating blood. He has tears from his face and he's crying out, Lord, surrender. Lord, I surrender. And he's doing this for you and he's doing this for me. And we got, instead of running from this pain, Jesus takes it to the foot of the cross. He takes it to his father. And he says, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And here's his surrender. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see, In this example of surrender, Jesus followed the calling for his life. He followed the journey that God put him on and that led him to being hung on a cross. Today, we are all being called on a journey and that journey leads us to the foot of the cross. Now, this surrender calls for action. It isn't just words that we can say, it's what we do. Now, This surrender we are being asked, we can either surrender to Jesus and join him in the second coming, or we can join the mocking crowd and be fools in the end. It isn't our free will that Jesus is asking us to surrender like I used to think. It isn't our fun, it isn't our freedom, but rather he's asking us to surrender our burdens to him, our lives to him. He wants to do our life with us and he invites us at the foot of the cross to do life with us to lift our burdens surrender is not the act of giving up it is the act of giving over our lives recognizing that without Jesus we can do nothing without him we aren't saved and so friends today Jesus is calling you he is calling me to surrender he is calling us to give him our burdens, to lighten our load, to give us victory over sin. And I pray that today you choose surrender. I pray that today you choose victory.